Hello, and welcome to the Diverse Thinking, Different Learning Podcast. As you know, I'm your host, Dr. Karen Wilson, and today, Cody Harms is joining me. Cody is a neuroaffirming therapist, educator, and advocate with over 15 years of experience working with neurodiverse children, teens, and adults. As a board-certified behavior analyst and co-owner of Curated Family Therapeutics, he is going to help us continue the discussion on neurodiversity and increase our understanding of what it means to give and receive neuroaffirming care. Join me in welcoming Cody to the podcast. Millions of kids struggle with learning, processing, and social emotional difficulties. These challenges interfere with their ability to reach their full potential. Dr. Karen Wilson is here to help. Her extensive background in pediatric neuropsychology and higher education have prepared her for this unique mission. Listen as she delivers content to inform, educate, and empower parents and educators. This will enable you to identify challenges that kids face and get them on the road to achieving their full potential. This is Diverse Thinking, Different Learning by Child Nexus. Hi, Cody. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Karen. Thanks for having me. I am so glad you're here. I'm really glad that Deanna connected us. I think she was the one who put us in contact with each other. Yes, I found her. She told me about how cool you are. And then I had the, she connected us. So very, very excited to be here. I'm excited too. You know, a while back I did an episode about neurodiversity and shared tips for supporting neurodivergent youth. And I wanted to continue that conversation. And so when she made the connection, it was the perfect opportunity to expand on the discussion about neurodiversity, but also to um, discuss neuroaffirming care and support and what that looks like. So thrilled that we are going to be talking to you and and sharing a little bit the work that you do. Maybe you can start by talking about the work that you do, and then we'll kind of jump into this conversation. Yeah. Well, I am co-owner of Curated Family Therapeutics. We are a private practice and we really have three modes of support. So the first one is we provide one-to-one acceptance and commitment therapy um, to neurodiverse teens and adults. A lot of times uh, these individuals come to us because they're new to their diagnosis and they want to talk about that and discover their life with a diagnosis and that understanding. Um, oftentimes people will come to us because they've had previous therapists that haven't had our, you know, 10 plus years of experience in the neurodiverse uh, community. And then the uh, the second service that we provide is we work with parents of neurodivergent children, um, anywhere from my child just got their diagnosis at three to, um, you know, my child, a teenager and sort of working through all things that teenagers work through. Um, to, you know, my child may need some uh, conservatorship and I'm not really sure how to go through that conversation with my other child or with my partner or, or however that looks. Um, and then the third primary service we offer is we take that one-to-one therapy hour and we apply it with in the classroom. And I'm a third generation educator. My business partner is a professor at CSUN. So, so education is a really important environment for us. Um, as you know, and as we all know, it, you know, it shapes the society after it just after kids graduate. So it's really important to us that um, not only are teachers at their best mental health, so their students can be be provided the most opportunities, but then also oftentimes it's the young neurodivergent students who may not fit in sort of those traditional educational situations and therefore need some adaptation with their curriculum and um, the socialization and all the things that come with learning in, in elementaries and middle and high schools. Wonderful. So it really is your work extends from getting that diagnosis, which might be as early as three and supporting the family to, you know, high school. Yeah. And then through adults and you know, I, I'm working with CEOs to, you know, guys that are wanting to work through their marriage to um, young men and women that are looking to enter relationships and are, you know, as confusing as those are for all of us, let alone uh, trying to process um, your brain is a little bit different in, in the world and um, just trying to figure it all out. So we'd love to help with all that. Right. And we know that neurodiversity impacts individuals differently in their daily lives, you know, for some of the, and some of the ways you've already kind of described. And, and I think that's one of the reasons why it's so important to recognize neurodiversity and also to celebrate it and rather than kind of viewing these differences as deficits that need to be fixed. And so when we think about 
that shift in our thinking, which really has evolved over time for for so many people, I think for as society in general. Yeah, very recently. Yes. Yeah. How do you incorporate that way of thinking um, into your work? Sort of like the neuroaffirming yeah. sort of. For me, you know, it starts with sort of like questioning my own sort of like neurotypical norms and like how I was raised. You know, each generation gets a little bit more understanding and empathetic and celebratory of neurodiversity. You know, we look at like 2000 when I was a kid, you know, it was one in I think 200, 250 people were diagnosed on the autism spectrum. Now it's one in 38 um, and growing. We just know so much more about the brain and neurodiversity and things like social media and research are providing so many wonderful new voices. Um, and we can really see the vastness of the spectrum. In particular, we talk about autism, in particular, with the neurodiversity. Um, and so that's provided so many opportunities for clinicians like myself to meet, um, you know, neurodiverse educators or neurodiverse providers or in academia. Um, and then I've spent my last 15 years of my life within that community, whether it's with parents or teachers or individuals. And um, I think that really shapes, you know, I focus on the person, not the diagnosis. And that's really shaped the way I provide care. And I've never had a desire to change who you are or the way your brain works. I just want you to make you the best version of yourself. And I want to help with that. Um, so, yeah, that, that's that's a big portion of a client led. Um, yeah. And again, I, just, I think this starts with sort of like questioning as we have navigated our whole life through this neurotypical norms and world, especially as we work through like bills. Um, what, what, what is like, what is really appropriate and, and how can we change the environment and, and how can I meet somebody where they're at so they can be successful and, and ultimately live their best life? Right. And I think that's, that's really key, that piece about changing the environment, because that's really what we want to change, right? We want to change the environment so that supports the differences in the way our brains are wired and the way that we learn and the way that we interact with the world and the way that we think. And, you know, I think probably a new term for a lot of families is that idea of neuroaffirming care that you mentioned or neuroaffirming support. And, you know, people might be unfamiliar with what does that mean? And I think you did a beautiful job of, job of describing kind of what that means and what that care entails. And it's so important for parents who are seeking services for their, their child, their teen, their family to understand what that means so that they can seek out the appropriate level of support. Yeah. And I think for me too, like a lot of that is educating, especially younger parents, or actually oftentimes it's older parents that have it. Like, cause I think neuro, the, the idea of like neuroaffirming care and the idea of neurodiversity, it's less than 10 years old. And I think really less than like five years old and sort of like the cultural zeitgeist, you know, like those are terms that are new to the social media and, and like really being pushed by the the autism community and really shaping us as providers over the last five to 10 years, which is what we need to be listening to the people that we serve because that's that's the goal. Um, so oftentimes, again, like I said, with older parents and, and even new parents, I'm the one educating them on what this neuro affirming care is going to look like and then how they can adapt that with their parenting or how they can look for that when they um, are talking to teachers at schools. And again, it's shaping that my, my goal of this is less so focus on the individual client and more so shaping the environment and starting with schools, right? Like how can we create neuroaffirming education within there? And then hopefully that trickles down through throughout time. And I love that listening to the people that we serve. I think that is absolutely critical and should be central to the work that we do um, and the way that we support families. Um, I know that you incorporate neuroaffirming practices, you know, as a therapist, that you work with schools to help them implement practices that support students and the families that that they serve. Are there specific examples of neuroaffirming practices that educators can adopt? Because oftentimes we think about the therapeutic process as one-on-one -on -one or one, one therapist with a family, but you talked about kind of expanding that work into the educational setting. I'd love for you to talk about that. Yeah. Well, I always want to meet with those that have the greatest influence over the environment. So that's generally the admin team and the teachers. And those are my primary focus as much as like, again, I've had such a history working with individual students. I know it's the parents and it's the admin team and it's the teachers that really dictate the opportunities for, for the kiddo. In this case, when we talk about admin team and teacher, they're not just dictating the opportunities for maybe the 
three or four kiddos that that have a, a neurodiverse diagnosis in the classroom, but they're also dictating it for all of the other students who are interacting with them. And everybody's learning on the same same page. So a lot of what I do is we teach um, socio, we, we encourage like different opportunities for social emotional learning within the whole classroom. And some of that is geared towards not isolating um, an individual and the, the style in which they learn or the style in which they they cope, but identifying that everybody does this in a different way. And everybody's brain is a little bit different. And it's important for everybody to utilize something like the calm corner, you know, something where we have an opportunity to regulate. And this isn't like just a few kids that need this. No, we all need this. And we all utilize this throughout our entire life. Me as a grown up, as I would identify in the classroom, I use the calm corner. My version maybe is going for a walk and listening to music or doing yoga. Your version maybe is going to the calm corner and playing with some sort of like fidget, fidget toy or laying down or talking to your friends or talking to yourself um, and regulating that way. Um, so that's just kind of one of the ways that that we practice. But I think, again, it starts with trying to we work often with like kindergarten because that's where it starts kindergarten through third. And it's really like helping the teachers and the admin team change the way in which we understand the students and making sure that all the students understand that they're on sort of the same wavelength. And what we're teaching for one student is also important for another student. And we're all learning, we all learn differently because our brains all work different. And I think it's so important to start that understanding at an early age, when you, yes. know, when you mentioned kindergarten, because you're really normalizing differences in the way we think, the way we learn, and again, the way we experience the world. And what you're speaking to is really helping kids, teachers, educators, um, anyone who's in that child's environment to understand that we all have different needs. And, you know, and also the ability to express yourself in a way that lets people know what it is that you need. So everybody will need that calm corner. You know, I need a calm corner <laughs> often <laughs> during the day, but we're normalizing the need for having that quiet time, that quiet space. Yeah. And I think the, think the big thing for me, Karen, is that um, it's not, although like K through third is really important, right? You get them while they're young, you sort of normalize it, you make it matter of fact, but Again, these are lifelong skills. You and I are coping. So these needs to be things that are explicitly taught and explicitly rewarded through high school because it just gets more complex with socialization and and work and family and all the things that we know high school and puberty, right? All the things we know that high schoolers deal with. And I think the education system is great with like two plus two is four, but we're and we're rewarding that with an A, right? But we're never rewarding like, hey, I really loved how you helped your friend on the playground through X, Y, and Z. Or I really know that that was a challenging conversation you had, but awesome job and then look how far that's going to take you. Absolutely. I think that's a really important piece because again, rewarding, you know, that social emotional aspect of learning of, again, existing in the world and noticing, you know, I think I talked to another educator who talked about the fact that part of social emotional learning and for educators and for parents is just noticing things and bringing it to the attention and the awareness of students. So, you know, I noticed that you were really frustrated and I saw that you walked over into the calm corner. You know, what a great way to really help regulate, you know, that big emotion that you were having and what an impact that can have with noticing and then reinforcing that behavior. Yeah. And let's, let's talk about it too. One of the projects I did with the school this year is we did, um, we did, we took the social emotional learning that we were doing at school and we'd applied it to home. So I had all the students, um, record with their parents, how they apply social emotional learning at home, whether it's like, I use a calendar with my dad for my chores, or it's, um, my dad and I meditate and we're going to put it on video and we're going to share our friends. And it was really cool because the students were like, Oh my gosh, we're on camera and we get to show our friends our house and us doing cool stuff. So they were really motivated to do it. But then at the same time, it sees like, oh, you know, little Timmy, he um, he meditates. And, you know, uh, little Dave, he goes to his room and relaxes with the lights off. And his dad um, walks outside and, and paces. You know, like everybody is doing it and everybody's doing it differently. And it's not something that we should be ashamed of or hide. It should be something that we celebrate. And I'm hopeful that like, while maybe the cone corner is something you need to utilize frequently at the beginning of the year, I hope the conversation in the spring is like, hey, 
I know that math test was really hard, but I noticed that you just took deep breaths at your desk and you didn't even need the calm corner because you've adapted and you've grown um, because we know there's not always a calm corner available throughout life, right? Figure out how to respond and adjust as as quickly as we can because, you know, the world is big, bad and mean sometimes. It absolutely can be. And, And there are a lot of challenges for students, you know, in traditional classroom settings and I think some of the most successful experiences that students have had is when, again, that environment really supports the way that they learn and the way that they think. Before we continue this conversation, I wanted to take this opportunity to thank our Child Nexus partner, Riverview School. There are good schools, there are great schools, and then there are life-changing schools like Riverview. It is a place where students with learning differences experience the genuine joy of learning in an environment where they can thrive and feel welcome for being exactly who they are. Located on a stunning campus in Sandwich, Massachusetts, Riverview is a co-ed boarding and day school for students between 11 and 22 years old with complex learning challenges. To find out more about their year-round programming, visit riverviewschool.org. That's riverviewschool.org. Now, let's get back to our conversation. Have you encountered through your work with schools challenges, um, some similarities in terms of the kinds of challenges that neurodivergent students face in traditional classroom settings? Um, Yeah, I think for me, you know, like as adults, we have calendars and we have clocks and we have timers and visual mediums are just a part of like executive functioning. Like for any human, any adult, we're using them forever. We're all on our phones. Um, and I think the schools, they, they do a nice job of having visual mediums, but they're not always explicitly teaching them. And so I like to make, particularly for my, my neurodiverse or virgin friends, is I always like to make individual like schedules, individual um, like visuals, whether it's on their desk or something that's like catered towards them within the classroom. And I really like to explicitly teach that as a skill, not only for them recognizing as the teacher is going through it, so their environment can be predictable. And we can teach them to have a say of like, hey, what if we change math and English? Like, does it make a big difference? Or they can have a say of, um, you know, what they want to do specifically during recess, but creating visuals to, to make sure that the environment is predictable and is understandable, and then allowing them to have the say, I think is is really important. And it's just sort of like a general universal strategy that like every class I go into the feedback is like, you know, this child is not having as much success. And I, and I know they're really smart and I really want them to be successful. That is sort of like constantly the first one we go to because you and I, I know exactly what I'm doing after this session, right? I knew exactly when to show up on time. Sometimes those skills need to be more explicitly taught and utilizing it is, is helpful. Right. And that that piece about being explicitly taught is so important. I mean, we do that with reading, right? We know that reading has to be explicitly taught. It's not something you just pick up. And yeah. we need to expand that to other things as well, um, given, again, the diversity of learners that we have in our classrooms. Yeah. I think sometimes teachers feel like, oh, I, you know, I have to focus on reading. I have to focus on math and I have to focus on science. And the, all those things are really important there. The, but for me, always the root skill is it's like, we're not feeling comfortable or if we're not aware when science is like, maybe that's not as important as like giving a grade to like, Hey, I noticed that you checked off the first class and you, I saw you read science is next on your calendar. That's amazing. Like I'd rather teach that the first few months of school than getting towards any of any of the science stuff. Absolutely. It just seems that there are so many ways that we can create inclusive and supportive environment for students. And even if that includes adapting a curriculum, it sounds like you you spoke to a little bit about that, adapting a curriculum so that it accommodates the varied learning profiles of all students. Yeah. And I think, and you know, it's teaching is like the hardest job ever, right? You know, like it's not, Agreed. <laughs> not for like, because they don't want to, right? Or even sometimes they don't have the skill, like time and is often a, a really big challenge. But the thing that I'm really proud of is when we're in the classroom, my goal is to not add anything to your plate. My goal is to adapt your day to hopefully like these things just become habitual. And it's not like, you know, I, I had to spend two more hours after school preparing for the next day. No, it's like these things are habitual and they happen throughout the day. And you're sort of meeting the things that are important to you and your classroom. And more often than not with teachers, it's I want my students to succeed. I want them to feel 
successful and happy within my classroom. So we, we figure out easy tips and tricks to sort of create these environmental changes, such as like an individual schedule on the student's calendar, um, all within hopefully your, your typical routine as a teacher. Now, you know, when we spoke initially, when we started the conversation, you talked about your therapeutic philosophy that centers around acceptance and commitment therapy. Um, I know you do that in the context of your one-on-one work. Does it come into play when you are supporting families or consulting with educators? I'd love for you to talk about kind of what that means, first of all, and then how you integrate it into the work you do. Yeah, acceptance and commitment therapy is kind of just acknowledging that like challenges are going to be presented in life. You know, like we started this session and it took us five minutes to figure out how to hear each other. <laughs> yes. um, and we didn't give up. We we have learned throughout time to sort of accept that sometimes technology is your friend. It isn't. Um, and that's going to happen throughout everybody's life, right? Like I'm going to drive to a really important meeting and get a flat tire on the way. You know, am I going to let that defeat me or am I going to keep moving? And am I going to use, you know, certain strategies and certain coping skills to maybe not feel a 10 out of 10, but maybe I can still feel a 7 out of 10 about my day because even though I was late for the meeting, I, I still made it and I still, you know, I still uh, knocked it out of the park. So in terms of our, what we do in um, acceptance and commitment therapy is if you're working towards your values, the things that you find important to your life, the sort of North Star that's guiding you, you can't go wrong. And the more you work towards the values, the more you increase your opportunity of feeling happiness and achieving your goals uh, more often than not. Now, we in our sessions, we take a measurement from one to 10 each week on how you're feeling about your mental health, one being like ready to give up. 10 being like living my best life. We never expect anybody to be 10 out of 10 every week, obviously, because as acceptance and commitment therapy is telling us, the world is going to present so many challenging variables. But if you're living 8 out of 10 on average or 7 out of 10 on average, regardless of what's happening in your life, you know, you're getting the flat tire and your dog is sick. um, That's really impressive. And um, the way that we sort of observe and and, and get that measurement is we always start with um, a values assessment. And I do that across all of the therapeutic practices, right? So with teachers, often their values are student success and um, maybe some individuality within their classroom. And for parents, it's often, you know, independence for their child or um, social skills. I think the one thing that I I keep in mind is that I, when I do the values assessment, I want to focus on the individual, not the teacher. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. You know what's important to you, not what's important to the school or what your Advent team. Oftentimes those things overlap, but I really want to know what's important to you. And as parents, I want to know what's important to you as an individual, not just considering you as a parent, right? And same with the clients that I work with. If you're 17, your mom and dad might be saying this. Is that as important to you as something else? What do you value and how can we break those? um, How can we break that down so you can work towards that on a daily basis? And that value piece seems to be critical, right? And just, again, it speaks to what do you value as a person, as a human being, you know? And again, what is the school value? What is the school value? There can be some overlap in the role of a teacher. Again, I think about, you know, an adult as a person, an adult as a parent, and the overlap between those things. What do you value for yourself and for your role as a parent and for your family? And it seems like there's a lot of overlap But again, that acceptance piece really seems critical just to the whole idea of providing neuroaffirming care, right? When you talked about working with families from the point of diagnosis and then, you know, teenagers in high school, it seems that that's such such a critical piece. Yeah, no, I mean, I agree. I mean, thinking about like some of my clients, when we think about like neurodivergence or neurodiversity, like sometimes like the brain and like some of your fine motor movements, they're just not connecting. They're just not listening to each other. And that can be frustrating. And um, you can be frustrated by it and you can sort of allow it to eat you up or you can accept that that's a thing and you can do exercises to, to get a little bit stronger or to get a little bit more connectivity. Or you can create adaptations in your house because you know like it's such a struggle to brush your teeth with the, with the deficits that you have. Um, and when you're working towards your values, oftentimes those are the things that are pushing you to uh, address those challenges that you face every day. And is, are, is a value part of the commitment piece of the acceptance and commitment therapy? Yes. So the value is sort of like it creates the, the, the values define the actions that you want to take towards, the, is, which are the commitment, right? So 
um, again, like I was saying, like maybe you're uh, a teacher and you really value social emotional skills, right? And so the commitment would be is like, you know, instead of I'm, I'm going to make those videos that I was talking about earlier, right? I, or I'm going to go on the playground and I'm going to encourage kids to play with one of the students that I know struggles socially, you know, and like, that's going to be my commitment. I'm going to do that every week on Thursdays, something like that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that, and that makes sense. And it, it again, it fits so beautifully with the social emotional learning, like knowing yourself and then also the neuro affirming care. And these, and kind of knowing what your values are, but then having a practical piece with what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do that's going to show to yourself and to others that this is something that you value? Yeah, no, that's really important. And the thing that I think we're really proud of and that we sort of specialize is and like, oftentimes people can identify the value and say like, okay, here's how I get there. But maybe they set themselves up for running 25 out of the 26 miles of the marathon, you know, and what we focus on is like, how can we make them habitual? How can we break them down in sort of a daily or weekly occurrence? And if you only walk a half a mile your first week, that's, that's still a massive win, you know, like let's come back and let's celebrate that and let's figure out what you were successful with that half mile. And then maybe the following week, we either walk a whole mile or we run a half and then walk the second half. But either way, you're sort of working towards your values and that makes you have opportunities to feel better. And it's really the the boat that lifts all the tide that lifts all boats. When you're working towards your values, everything else in your life is better. So oftentimes parents will come to me and they're like, you know, I want my I want help for my son, or I want help for my daughter, and like they're struggling with this and this. And that conversation within the first month of session changes back to them. And when they're at their peak, they provide the most opportunity for their their kiddos. Same with teachers. When teachers are feeling their best mentally, they provide the most opportunity for their classroom and, and so on and so forth. Absolutely. I love that. I love you that. And, you know, I'm always so inspired, Cody, when I'm speaking with individuals who are really dedicated and committed to supporting neurodivergent in, neurodivergent individuals, um, families in our community, and really fostering these inclusive environments. And, and that's what you do. So I can't thank you enough for joining us today. It's been such a great conversation and a great extension of the conversations we keep having about neurodiversity, about, again, being more inclusive in our environments and being more willing to understand and accept people for all the beautiful differences that they bring to the world. Yeah, accept and celebrate. And I'm yeah, really glad to be here. I also like, it's really wonderful to, to work in the schools with because each generation, you know, like the younger ones are so much different than than, you know, everybody else or all the older ones. And and they're already more accepting and they're already more celebratory. And it's really wonderful to see. And I'm, I'm you know, take great pride in being able to, to push it along a little bit further, too. So, yes. For listeners who want to learn more about you and your work, what is the best way for them to connect with you, Cody? Ooh, we have a website and we have an Instagram and my number, my email is on all of that. Um, Instagram is at Curated Family Therapeutics. Um, website is www.curatedfamilytherapeutics.com. Um, and you can contact, you can DM us. You can, there's a number on there. You're welcome to, to text us or call us, whatever is comfortable for you. Um, we offer free consultations. We also offer some like free trainings. Sometimes people will be like, you know, they won't do that, but all you got to do is ask and we'll figure it out. Um, so, yeah, please reach out if you have any questions um, or you, are you just curious. I'd be more than happy to, to help out and, and answer anything I can. Wonderful. And I will be sure to put a um, link to your website, Instagram and all that information in the show notes so people can reach out to you. Thank you again for being here and for this wonderful conversation. Yeah, no, no. Thank you. I really appreciate it. It was awesome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Be sure to check out the show notes. There you'll find more information about Cody and how to connect with him. You will also see a number of resources expanding on the topic we discussed today. Episode 168 is five tips for supporting neurodivergent youth. So be sure to check out that link. And episode 120, meeting the needs of culturally and neurodiverse students with Juniette Kanga and Maria Kennedy. Thanks again for listening, and I will see you next time. Thanks for listening to Diverse Thinking, Different Learning by Child Nexus. For more resources, visit us online at childnexus.com.